right. Uh, I have the pleasure this morning of introducing Professor uh, Tom Walker from um, Wayne State University. He is the uh, professor uh, or the interim dean of the Library and Information Sciences and um, the State Wayne State University Libraries School of Information Sciences. So um, he received his PhD in Library and Information Sciences from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, in 1992, and he has more than 30 years of experience in the academic and information technology worlds. So this morning he's going to be talking about bibliometric mapping, hidden access to research environments. Um, I've been looking forward to this one. Um, Tom can go very, very deep, and he has uh, brought it up a little bit of a level for, for all of us uh, less academic people this morning. So looking forward to this talk, and uh, I'll turn that over to Tom. Thanks. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? I think you're overly optimistic about the level that I'm going to take it to, but I appreciate the thought. <clears throat> First of all, I've been in the library field for a very long time, you know, more than 30 years total. And I thought it was very interesting to hear from Emily and Iris this morning about wayfinding, also from Leah. I mean, what constitutes a built environment in our information world? I was also talking to a couple of people earlier about their early library experiences. We, we go through life not knowing what a library is. We go into a library and we can see physical manifestations of books, periodicals, and those kinds of things. But the content that is contained in them is, is not tangible. It's intangible. It exists. These concepts exist in our heads. And that is one of the challenges of information architecture to make that, uh, that, that conceptual space navigable. Now, I remember my first uh, uh, librarian in school. This was a Catholic school. Uh, Sister Anne was her name. She was the only nun who wore a habit. Do any of you know what a habit is? It's the, okay, <laughs> okay maybe another. But it, it's, it's the long black gown, basically. She was an old school nun and a, an old school librarian. The weird thing about her was, well, she was very strict, of course, but the weird thing was she lacked an index finger. So that instantly created all kinds of stories. She couldn't shush. <laughs> you know? So there was that. But she, she was really a good instructor. She helped us kind of get oriented within the library at my high school. Now, orientation, that, the word orient or orientation came up in Emily's talk, too. And I thought, OK, I, I should have put that in mind because it is really central to what we're talking about today. Orientation. I went from that high school uh, to University of Colorado Libraries, and I was blown away. Because it, 35 branches, one of the largest academic libraries in the country, and it, it, it dwarfed my little high school library. And not just the physical manifestations that you could see everywhere, but the content. There were things in periodicals. There were databases even back then um, it, it was a complex information environment even before the, the age of the internet. So it, it, was a, it was an awesome experience. I never thought then that I would work in a library. Of course, things changed, and I've been in libraries for many, many years. I wanted to start with this uh, photograph, though. That's a lot of people, isn't it? When you think about your, the networks that you have formed, uh, your social networks, uh, you, 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 it, it's amazing to think that with a picture like this, or maybe views you've had of New York City or other big cities, that it's amazing to think that anyone ever meets anyone and becomes friends with anyone. So what is it that allows you to deal with crowds of people like that and create a set of friends? And that's an open question. It's not a rhetorical question. I'm hoping for real answers. I saw a hand. It was a glass adjustment, I see. What, what gives you access to a network uh, in a crowd like that? I'm sorry? Appearance, Appearance yeah. Th th there might be some connection there, uh, some, something, that you, something that attracts you or that makes someone interesting. What else? Think of the characteristics of your friends, too. Yes? Boldness. I'm sorry? Boldness. Boldness. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Uh, outward, outward going. Uh, that, that, that's an interesting point. Uh, yeah. What's in the back? I'm, I'm sorry. 
Eye contact. Great. That's certainly true. Yes? <laughs> Shared frustration and New York City go hand in hand, I think. Uh, but but, it, but it certainly uh, people unite against their enemies, so I, I can see your point there. And, and that, that one of the key, one of the key uh, components to your uh, point is that it's, uh, um, there, there's something shared there. Yes? Common language. Yeah, common language, certainly. Because if, if, this, if this was a, uh, in, in a country other than uh, a country in which you are a native speaker, it could be quite a different scene there. I mean, it would be more difficult to forge friendships, for instance. So what other connections? Just a couple more. Yes? Yeah, that, that's a very good one. Shared experience. A shared experience with someone you, you went to school with or you discovered that you went to the same school. That's an amazing connection right there. Yes? Oh, another hand. One, so, so what I'm looking for here are connections that exist. Uh, the more connections you would have with a bunch of people in that photo, uh, the, the, the closer you would be to those people. So you might have one minor connection with someone down there, but you might have two or three with someone in the middle. And with your very best friend, you probably have multiple connections. And that's, that's kind of the thrust of where I'm going with this bibliometric topic. Uh, there, there are things that are shared, uh, experiences that are shared that pull people together. Just as there are in the bibliographic world, there are things that connect ideas in the published realm. So we'll, we'll get into that a little bit. Uh, but you can see the, the, the throngs of people there. Uh, you can also see the throngs of ideas here, I think. You could, did you do that or did I? I did. OK. Yeah, for some reason, this isn't. Yeah. There we go. You can't really see anything on this chart. You don't need to, but th this, is, this is a similar crowd. This is a crowd of different kinds of concepts that are displayed uh, using a, a, an idea that has been around in our field for a long time. And by our field, I mean information science. It's, it's an idea that allows data to be, uh, uh, statistical data about published uh, uh, units to be uh, graphically displayed. So in this case, you've probably seen term clouds before. That, that's a, a one manifestation. This is a little more technical. It, it links, th this particular one is a keyword co-occurrence uh, diagram. So the, the different nodes that you see here uh, represent different co-occurrences of terms uh, that are shared by different documents. So the, the, larger, the, uh, the larger the node, uh, the, um, uh, the, the more frequent the uh, connections are. Uh, the lines have to do with uh, co-occurrence as well, and the colors have to do generally with large areas of, uh, of uh, uh, topics. And the, the biggest one here happens to be big data. Big data has been around in our field for a long time. It hasn't been called big data. Uh, I, I hear that the iSchool here has a new degree in a, a data analysis or, or big data, data science. Uh, but the, I, bibliographically, uh, this concept goes back uh, even to the, to the 1800s. Law is one field that has featured uh, data as a supporting uh, characteristic to help uh, researchers, legal researchers in this case, understand uh, whether a, a certain, let's say, uh, a, a court opinion has been superseded. So the, the weird thing about that is you have to know, you have to be able to look at something uh, in front of you and understand if it has been uh, replaced by something in the future. It's one thing to use a bibliographic tool to look in the past and find different kinds of things from the past, but it's another to find something that has uh, uh, been changed in the future. So th th welcome the 1950s and the 1960s when the first bibliographic databases got started, um, especially in law and medicine, uh, there were some super advances that allowed uh, researchers to statistically analyze citations at the ends of articles, let's say. So you would be able to look at patterns of publishing that would, that would certainly allow you to look backward, but also allow you to look forward or look sideways and group things 
in unusual or hidden ways. Now, uh, all of you probably are aware of indexes, bibliographic indexes and those kinds of things. You don't even need those to use um, citation analysis to find uh, emerging fields. In fact, you can't necessarily find emerging fields using traditional old-fashioned bibliographic tools. So that's where citation indexes and other uh, kinds of things uh, like that come in handy. If you could advance. Thank you. The term bibliometrics has been interchangeable with infometrics and scientometrics for a long time. I think I, I prefer infometrics because it's, I think it's broader than bibliometrics, but bibliometrics is probably the most common of the three. Uh, so, but if you run into those, they, they overlap so much that it uh, almost doesn't uh, matter. Uh, there are purists who like to distinguish one from the other, but as far as I'm concerned, you don't need to. Thank you. Uh, so what is bibliometrics? So what are bibliometrics? Uh, they are applications of statistical methods to analyze published work. Uh, data can include information about authors, institutions, content, or citations. An example of bibliometric data about authors would be uh, a, a, a large, let's say, citation database that keeps track of the authors, co-authors, uh, groups of authors, and uh, their characteristics. So some databases would show uh, the information about the authors themselves. Some of them are pretty sketchy on that, so that's a limitation. Others are pretty detailed, and you can learn something about uh, gender patterns and things like that in the, in the published world. Uh, also, you can find information about uh, institutions. This would, uh, this we could show you statistically that there are fields of uh, development that are associated with one particular university, a cluster of universities that work together historically, or uh, or a, a scattering, a broad a broad scattering of topics. Uh, you know, pretty pretty much. Uh, uh, spread evenly throughout a country, let's say. So if you go back into the earlier history of information science in the United States, there were clusters, Case Western, uh, Case Western Reserve, University of Chicago, uh, Columbia University, there were certain pockets of activity that you can find bibliometrically. You, you don't necessarily see them listed, although you can find articles about them, but you can find bibliographic evidence that shows there were these collaborators, sometimes co-authors, um, who, who work together on these emerging topics in information science, information seeking behavior, those kinds of things that, are, that, that were pretty central to information science back in the day. Interestingly though, it's not just people who co-authored, it's people who cited other people. So if you had a researcher at Case Western, for instance, who cited uh, several other people, that, that, that they were cited for a reason. Usually people cite other studies because they are related in some way. In odd circumstances, they might disagree with something, but in general, you cite something or authors cite something that uh, represents the topic uh, that you're covering yourself. So that means there's a bibliographic link right there. So that's a citation link that, that, that's listed uh, last year. Uh, so by, by, by virtue of the fact that I cite 13 people or 14 people, uh, at the end of my article or throughout the article, that means that there is a subject link, linkage between me and those uh, other people. Now, if there's another author in, uh, let's say at another institution, who cites uh, 10 of those same 13 uh, in an article, you don't even need really to look at the, at the subject headings or the descriptors to understand that our two studies are probably pretty closely related. So by virtue of the fact that I cited 13 and the other person cited 10 of those 13, our two articles are related just through the citations. So that's, that, that's what I mean by hidden. Now, all of this contributes to uh, um, a structure that is invisible, um, invisible to us. And th this gets back to the point that Leah made in the uh, overall, uh, in, the, in the keynote. Uh, she was talking about uh, built environments so when you think about the information world, especially the bibliographic world, that contains different kinds of concepts, regardless of format, books, periodicals, uh, other kinds of documents, videos, uh, et cetera, what kind of built environment links those topics? That's the trick. 
I think it, it, a lot of that, a lot of what is going, I'm hoping go, is going on in your head right now is trying to get you to, to understand what kind of structures there might be that link the topics. It's not necessarily visible through subject headings or index terms or those kinds of things. It's a structure that exists for the topics through whatever concepts they happen to be. It, it, to me, this is one of the most fascinating things of this field. It's just remarkable to imagine that, yes, this is a built environment, but it's an in, in, intangible environment that requires a fair amount of work to get through. So think about your own first experience when you went into a large academic library. It could be Michigan, could be another major university, it could be just a, a college library after having been in high school uh, for many years. It's a, it's a vastly different setting and it can be disconcerting. Luckily, today we have websites that help uh, guide us through. If you think about the university uh, that, that you know the best and think of its website, that does help orient you around the built information environment, but only up to a certain point. There are a lot of things that are hidden. There are certainly books through a catalog. There are multiple proprietary databases, some of which cost hundreds of thousands of dollars each year. Um, there are a lot of those kinds of things. It guides to statistics, uh, guides to government documents. All of these things uh, are accessible separately. And uh, to wrap one's head around the array of those for any one thorough search of a, of a given topic is a, is a monumental task. That's where information professionals come in handy. Not, it's a changing world, and that's another reason I am especially happy uh, to have been in this field for so long. These are some examples of some applications. Oh, thank you. Uh, you uh, using bibliometric data, you can evaluate the impact of a researcher's work on their field. Have any of you uh, worked in departments where citations have been used uh, or citation indexes have been used to evaluate the productivity or the uh, impact of a researcher? A couple of you. Yeah. Did you have any reservations about those methods? I think you make very good points, Iris. Uh, it, it, it's, uh, it, it's tempting to believe statistics in every possible way. I want to, uh, but, it, but it's all, life is always more complicated than you think it's going to be. So in, the, in this case, you have someone who has uh, really remarkable uh, uh, research uh, uh, credentials as far as uh, an impact as a scholar using scientific uh, citation indexes, but uh, the actual application depends on how, how those articles were used. It could be that someone accessed it and dismissed it. They didn't really even use it. Or uh, let's say someone has 450,000 hits uh, on a, 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 an institutional repository. What does, what does that mean? Does that mean they were really used? Uh, there are a lot of gaps in, in that, and so it's difficult to make, to draw conclusions necessarily. Nevertheless, it does give an indication of some, uh, some, uh, some uh, patterns. Uh, especially those that link by subject. So uh, that's, that's one thing that can be uh, useful. Uh, some of you who have experience with libraries might have heard of uh, journal impact factors. That's number two on this bulleted list. Uh, it, it, it's, it has been common over the last few decades to rank journals by impact factor, saying, okay, well, these, the, the, this set of journals at the top, the, the AA category, uh, that's the highest impact factor because they are the most prestigious, they've been the most cited, they're the, most, uh, they're, the, they're the most desirable for faculty to publish in. So if you publish in those, that counts more than publishing in lower journal impact uh, journals. Uh, uh, so th that's just uh, th th the way that happens to work. Of course, there are countless variations of that, but th this kind of tool can uh, provide a, 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 a measurement of journal impact. 
Uh, these kinds of uh, results can identify institutional centers of activity. If you can find out that there are a bunch of, uh, uh, of authors working on a particular topic, I'll, I'll get to a DNA map pretty soon, uh, then that, that shows that there's activity going on around a certain university or research center. Uh, and th there's some other, other uh, points here too. The one that I wanted to point out is specifically though was emerging specialties. So it's difficult to predict what kind of specialties are going to evolve. You can imagine, and there have been bibliometric studies on this, you can imagine that since the advent of COVID, there's been a huge amount of research that's been developed around COVID. Not just COVID itself, but also the social implications uh, in all different kinds of media. So, so chronicling that is one thing that can be done, and it's done, it can be done entirely without the use of journal, uh, excuse me, without index terms or subject headings uh, that you would find with books. It can also be used to identify collaborators and other patterns that would affect or that, that would describe gender differences. So if you, uh, one study that I did looked at gender differences in the, in a 20-year period of information science journals, looking to see, okay, <clears throat> between 1960 and 1980, or not, yeah, I think it was that 20-year period, um, it, it did women contribute more articles over that period of time by the end? The answer was just slightly more, but I used the graphic, uh, bibliometric data uh, for that. If you could move on to the next. <clears throat> Uh, I will go through this pretty quickly. I, I wanted to make the point about networks. You saw all of those people and you saw that first chart with all of those networks. That's part of what uh, Bibliometrics does. It helps you deal uh, with these kinds of networks graphically, also statistically aside entirely uh, from the uh, displayed uh, representation. Uh, some of the kinds of networks include uh, collaboration, uh, collaborative, uh, collaborative networks, semantic networks that link articles and other works by titles, abstract, and keyword lists. That's a little more understandable, and that's more traditional library science. Citation networks, though, are a unique uh, contribution to this field. Uh, they can link uh, articles to each other, uh, groups of articles, and so on. So, for instance, these are some representations of uh, citation mapping. Uh, this is through the web, the web of Science. Some of you might have used that. The Web of Science is an outgrowth of uh, the ISI, Institute for Scientific Information Citation Indexes from 1950s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. It grew into the Web of Science, which is one of the largest uh, databases around uh, for this kind of thing. But it, it, uh, these are displays of uh, citation mapping. So on the left, you see one article that cites a bunch of other articles. Uh, the, the one on the right, if you can move to the next, thank you. The, the uh, illustration on the right shows one article in the middle and it shows citations going backwards, but it also, also shows uh, uh, items in the future uh, beyond the date of that article that cite it. So that's the power of these citation indexes and that's what allows uh, researchers to develop these networks of, of combinations. And you can imagine it gets pretty complicated uh, when you when you bring more authors or more articles into the uh, into the equation, could you skip um, two, please, or three? Uh, could you go to the uh, go, go one more? I'm going to skip those. Uh, th this is one that I wanted to get to. Uh, this is an early citation map. Uh, this is uh, th I think from the 1960s. Uh, they were doing this even earlier than that. But uh, Eugene Garfield is the champion. He's a well-known figure in uh, citation analysis, and the, the, he was the main uh, 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 creator of the information science, scientific information citation indexes, science citation index, social science citation index, et cetera. This is a map of DNA research uh, history uh, that was compiled from a mini citation index of 65 historical articles. Now, this is a subset. I mean, at that time, when he developed this, it, there was no gigantic citation index. So he took uh, 65 historical articles and used them because they were able to point backward in time to earlier articles. So he traced the history of DNA research over a period of time. And you, ca you can't really see too many of the details on this, but I can point out that the earliest ones uh, are 1860s, 1820s, and so on, 1907. By the time you get to the top, it's 1961. 60, the early 60s, which is when this uh, chart developed. 
So the idea isn't brand new at all. It's just easier to do now because of the advent of computers and the ability to process large amounts of data. So this was painstakingly collected by hand and uh, tabulated and, uh, and, and calculated this way and eventually displayed. There are software packages that allow you to do this automatically though, so you don't have to worry about mapping it out. This was hand drawn uh, back in the, uh, in the early uh, 60s. I'd like to show you some other examples before I wrap up. You can move to the next one, uh, thank you. Uh, this is citation links by country. So using citations alone, you can find out where the nodes of activity were on this particular topic. USA is in the middle. You can see that uh, there's a lot of activity with USA. It's really closely attached to research that, uh, uh, that was done in the People's Republic of China. You can see other, other nodes too. Canada, Jordan, Australia are, uh, represent other nodes uh, by country. Uh, the next slide is a co-citation network which visualizes a lot of different uh, aspects of, uh, of a topic. Uh, you, you can't really see it too, too carefully or too closely, uh, but I wanted to just show you the graphic representation of it, using colors to represent subfields, uh, using uh, lines to represent more direct connections, and thicker and thinner lines to represent uh, more direct uh, uh, connections uh, also. So it, it's a rich way of, dis of displaying things. It isn't necessarily a wayfinder, but it does allow you to get a glimpse of the nature of uh, information in that field. So and, and when you consider that some of these topics are conceptually related, you can't really, um, it's not like walking into a, a new city or into a museum and finding maps. It, it's, it's, uh, it's more conceptual. So this is one way to display it. Uh, the next link uh, shows citation links by uh, institution. You can see the big one in the middle. I don't know if you can read it from where you are, but that's Harvard University. Uh, over, to the, over to the right a bit is University of Colorado, where I did my undergrad years. Uh, the University of Toronto is there, Oxford University, and some others. So uh, all of those uh, links show different kinds of uh, uh, connections that exist purely through citations. Uh, of one, one art, article or other bibliographic unit uh, to another. So th those, those create a structure that can be um, analyzed statistically and uh, presented in, uh, in uh, a graphical format uh, like this. The next one is um, Journal Co-Citation Network. Uh, it's, a, it's a journal co-citation network with 144 nodes. Of course, none of, I can't read any of them from here either, uh, but it represents the activity of the journal and the number of papers. So that's a lot of nodes. The closer the nodes are together, the higher the citation frequency, the co-citation frequency. Uh, the larger the node, the more active the journal and the number of papers. So the, most a the, the, the largest nodes uh, are very prominent, like JAMA, uh, Journal of the American Medical Association in this case, uh, and um, the, the smaller they are, the, 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 less, uh, the less active they are, and the smaller the number of uh, papers. And the color, colors correspond with different uh, areas of, or sub, subsets of uh, uh, subject. And the next uh, one shows keyword co-occurrence. Keywords, uh, it, you, you probably are familiar with keywords if you've ever searched Google. Uh, Google accepts words. I mean, it's, it's unfortunately an overly magical resource where you just type anything in and you hope that it works. That there are more, uh, more strategically designed and, and more uh, sophisticated applications of keywords that you find in indexes of different kinds, uh, and, and they behave in certain ways. Th th this, this deals with, that, with the more um, uh, rigid or the more uh, structural approach to uh, keyword uh, co-occurrence. Co in this case, case, the topic is medical big data uh, displayed our relative uh, sizes. So those are the size of the nodes. Proximity, once again, um, if, uh, if a node is close to another node, then there's more keyword co-occurrence. So if you have one, one keyword always occurring with another one, then that, that's an example of keyword co-occurrence. You, you probably experimented on your own even unconsciously when you do a Google search or other kind of keyword search. Some people are so used to doing keyword searches that they don't even 
uh, remember how to do index searches using standard descriptors from controlled vocabularies or um, uh, subject headings for, for books. Uh, so, the, the, it, so tracking these co-occurrences of, uh, of uh, terms, of uh, keywords, is one way to, make, to draw some conclusions about these. There are other ones that deal with, uh, the, 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 the colors deal with uh, various subcategories, in this case, big data, uh, care, risk, healthcare, and those kinds of uh, topics, subtopics uh, underneath uh, medical big data. And uh, one more, I think I have a couple more, but this one I wanted to bring up too. This, this one is oriented by chronology. So you have a, a, a several relationships at one end. Uh, the, the, I can read some of them to you. Um, care, women, critical care, intensive care, health care, and so on. Um, back in 1996, moving forward, you can see that the activity, the scholarly activity, the publication activity, changes over a period of time. So you can see graphically how these topics evolve over a period of time. Now, the large node on the right is electronic health record, uh, health, health records. There's and there's some other related ones: network machine learning challenges and, and those kinds of things. So the, the, you, you can see, and this is, I think this is a fascinating thing because it allows you to see graphically how a subject can change over a period of time. Who knows where it's gonna go, but it does, uh, th this kind of analysis can allow you to look at the change of a topic over a period of time. I wanted to bring up one uh, additional topic very quickly, altmetrics, alternative metrics. Uh, that goes beyond traditional bibliometrics. It brings other kinds of media into it, like social media, uh, looking at uh, in institutional repositories. I know Michigan has a big one. Wayne State has a very large one as well. And on that, it's, it's really gratifying to see students get, let's say, 45,000 hits. And you can identify where throughout the world those hits are coming from. Some topics just uh, are, uh, ignite interest. Uh, but th that's the kind of data that you can get from, or the, the, the altmetric data, uh, from other resources like that instead of from traditional scientific <clears throat> citation indexes. Uh, all other kinds of coverage would be news coverage, uh, geographic distribution of users, and so on. So uh, getting started, if you want to explore some of this, uh, I would recommend that you go to the Web of Science. Uh, there's a lot on the Web of Science website about how to explore bibliometrically. Uh, it's, it, it's an evolution from three citation indexes that existed in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, uh, the, the, from ISI, that evolved into this uh, monster resource that is very useful for indexing, excuse me, for uh, citation um, uh, uh, analysis. Scopus is another one. You probably have heard of that. Lens uh, focuses on patent documents and citing literature for patents. So the, the literature that cites patents is linked to those patents bibliographically. Just like, <clears throat> and you can imagine the, the legal world too. You have cases that are linked to, um, to statutes of different kinds, different levels of statutes. Uh, you have uh, law cases that are superseded by other law cases as it, as it moves forward through the court system uh, over, or over a period of time. So you can easily imagine following that there. And lastly, Google Scholar is a, a large bibliogra uh, bibliographic database that can be used for citation analysis. Uh, if you want to test some uh, of these bibliometric tools or uh, visualization tools for bibliometrics, uh, 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 there are some well-known ones. Tableau is one. ScienceGate. Uh, by, are, we, are we sharing these uh, presentations? We can. Okay, because th these are live links, so you can go, you can click through if you want. You could always just search on your own. ScienceGate, Tableau, uh, and there is a a research guide from a, another university that uh, covers bibliometrics, tools, and software. So you can get a list of tools uh, that would allow you to process bibliographic data from these databases and display it um, graphically. And lastly, there are some research guides for bibliometrics listed here. Uh, it's easy to, pretty easy to find them. Just enter uh, uh, bibliometrics research guides or, or libguides or something like that. Iowa State has a good one. University of Maryland has a very good one, uh, and there are others too. And I normally don't uh, 
suggest that everyone jump to Wikipedia first, but the Wikipedia article on bibliometrics is pretty detailed. Uh, it gives you a lot of jumping off points. You can, uh, you can take it for what the, the content for what it's worth, but I think it is pretty good. And you, you, there are lots of references there and lots of guidance through the history of bibliometrics and uh, the graphical displays of bibliometric data. So thank you very much. Thanks, Tom. Um, we're going to break for lunch right now. Um, we're going to come back at, uh, and we're going to start right at 1.45. So you guys got a little bit of a, a break for lunch. But before we do that, who wants a coaster? You want a coaster? You got some coasters? All right. I got a couple hands here. You guys responded pretty quickly. So who else said yes? Are you getting more? <laughs> So that's a couple hands back here. I got a couple more, so come back after lunch. We're gonna, um, we're gonna give away two more of those 700 page tomes, The Understanding, Understanding by Richard Saul Warman, who is a big influence to everybody at the Understanding Group. Dan Klein knows him personally, gets to spend uh, some time with him. He's had some pretty neat connections with other prominent people around the globe because of that. Um, yep, so we'll see you at 145. Looking forward to uh, coming back and hearing some other great talks. <laughs>